Y'all, this documentary was so over the top and messed up. We had to revisit it for like the second time in a few years, and we're gonna talk about it in today's video. Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the sofa. Sofa's back there. Roscoe's on it. I'm in front of it. My name's Paul and that's Roscoe. I already said that. Now look, y'all, today what we are doing is we are going to be reviewing the notes that I made for the podcast channel's live chat on the documentary Abducted in Plain Sight. This is basically the, this is the abridged version, okay? This is the little Cliff Notes version, okay? So this is, if you don't like the podcast version of it, or you might not even know I have that channel, this is just the, the condensed version of it. So, that being said, we have watched this before on this channel. It was a few years back. We've talked about it throughout the years, but there was another documentary, like a follow-up to it that came out. So I wanted to re-watch this one, and then the next week do the follow-up documentary, which I'm working on right now. That being said, if you've been here from the very beginning, you'll be like, we've already talked about this. Well, that's why we're talking about it again. There's still a lot to say. So that's all it is. So the way this video will work is I literally watch it. I make notes as I go through, and I'm just going to read through them and make commentary along the way. If you want to watch the live chat version of it, it's on the podcast channel. The link to that is down in the description below. Oh. Okay, so that being said, let's go ahead and jump on into it. I'm not going to do like a 60 second overview on it uh, because you'll very quickly find out just how we do this. I will say this. We're going to slap trigger warning all over this because this is one of the most next level stories you have ever heard. It does deal with SA. If that's triggering, it deals with cringe so hard and painful. You will be like, where's my hazard pay for listening to this? Okay. So just, you have been warned. Okay. You've been warned. So here we go. So again, the title is Abducted in Plain Sight. I watched it on Netflix. So Jan is essentially the centerpiece of this story. It opens up with hearing her abuser, who we are gonna to refer to as B, because B has the same name as like her father. It's like Robert Bob, they go by the same thing. So they called him B. So he is talking about her, but then it switches to her family's perspective. And her father, Bob, so remember her father's Bob, do the did bad things as B. And her sister are talking about the relationship they had with her and what Jan was like, which she was very normal, she was a wonderful person, all this type of stuff. Jan was the big sister. They felt like they had a good childhood. Now the mother is Mary Ann and the father, like I said, is Bob. The father, Bob, is a florist, he owned a shop and the mom stayed at home. Jan said she felt love growing up. B is the abuser. The mother recounts meeting, so Marianne, she recounts meeting B, his wife, they had like five kids or something like that, so whoever many they had at the time. She recounts meeting them when they first came to church, and everybody was like enamored by them, right? This family is amazing, they are so wonderful, they were a great family, and Bob and Marianne thought that he was just wonderful, Bob. You know, so... B, Bob said that things just clicked with them. They came home one day and there's this big fruit basket with a card and it was from B. Their neighbors too, remember this. Um, or, you know, they, they know each other, whatever. So it said how much he enjoyed meeting them. And Jan says, you know, they spent a lot of time around them with their kids. They were all friends. And they described B as like the fun dad, but they all said that his attention was definitely steered towards Jan. So just keep this in mind. Like he is basically smoozing this entire family. And we'll get more into what he does and the links he goes through to do this, but they are all just enamored by him. So the mom, Mary Ann, says that he gave special attention to Jan and it annoyed her and the father. Now keep this in mind because as we listen to this, and this is one of those tricky things where it's framed in such a way that they're all victims, but as you listen to this, you're probably gonna feel that Jan was a victim of more people than just B, I will say. Now, remember, there's a follow-up to this, Jan, and they're all, they they talk, they communicate her, her mother, not B. So she's reconciled whatever might have been there. So I'll say that, and that's what counts, because I do consider her the absolute victim of many people's, of the guy B, and then many people's very bad decisions. So there's that. Now, Jan says that B, which is what they call him, I already said that, was like a second father. She completely trusted him and felt safe with him. So October 1974, B calls them up and he wants to take Jan horseback riding. Uh, it's a school night. And so Mary and the mom, she's like, no, I mean, you know how it is. You know what I mean? Like, oh, no, she's going to be at school. She's going to do this. It's not a good night. Well, you already know Jan is like, oh my God, mom, let me go. I want to go horseback riding. It's just B. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know how kids are, right? So... 
she says, look, you better be home by dinner time. She tells B, she tells her, you know, so they head off to wherever. And when they get in the car, Jan will recount that he gave her these pills. And she says that he was always giving her allergy pills, which clearly you can put two and two together. He was sedating her. She would pass out. She would lose her memory. So she has no memory of ever going to the stables or getting there at this drive. So back home, day turns to night and there's no sign of Jan or Bob. Jan or B, I'm sorry. Again, his name is Bob but or Robert, but so I'm going to get it straight. I'm sorry. So they become worried, which is normal. Now, eventually, B's wife comes over, and Mary Ann is like, we should call the police. You know, this is, I mean, which what, what, what should we do? Well, the wife is essentially like, uh, they're going to come home. I'm sure they'll be back. Let's just wait, you know, that kind of thing. So, this goes on for two days. Just let that sink in. I don't have the can't roll my eyes hard enough cup on me. God knows I'd be drinking from it right now. Okay. And it gets worse. Okay. <laughs> it gets worse. So they remain missing for two days and the parents choose not to call law enforcement because they don't want to bother anybody and they don't want to get Gail. That's the wife of B upset. So the mother calls the FBI office Saturday morning. Like, you know, this day's good. This is like a five day span or something. She finally calls the FBI office Saturday morning. And they're basically closing like, look, you need to call the, if I have an emergency, call this other office. And the mother says she didn't follow through because she didn't want to get everybody all worked up. Not lying. You can go watch the documentary yourself. Doesn't want to get everybody all worked up. They wait longer. And on day five, they finally make the other phone call. Pause everything for a minute. Pick mouths up off the floor. Now, I'm going to say, and this is not an excuse right here, okay, at all. They will say this in the documentary. We'll get to it, but I can go ahead and say it. So apparently during this time, because this is like back when, you know what I'm saying? This is not anything recent. They're like, look, this whole thing of peds, you know what I'm trying to say? People who do this stuff with children. This was not this known thing. We didn't have these words for all this, like, you know, that kind of thing, right? So even the FBI guy will say this. So the mother and all of them, they will say were, we, kidnapping still, it just wasn't even a consideration. We just, it wasn't even consideration. We trusted this man. He was family. Now I'm going to get to that in one second because on that note, I have some questions, but let's finish reading this little section right here. So the FBI agent says they go to the house and they talk to the parents for a long time. They get all the information they can. And the parents still don't think that he's kidnapped her. They've just gone somewhere with her. They absolutely trust her. Pause there for one second. Day five goes by. They call the police. They do this. Gail says they'll be back. Now, first of all, you already know Gail's been through this. And we will find out he's done this to other people. So there's that. She probably knows this routine and like, yeah, they're okay. But Jan's not okay, right? But they're not whatever. She's trying to cover up her husband, you know? So my thing is this, that's going on when he disappeared with her. Here's my thinking too. What if they're both in the car in a ditch and it's upside down and they're praying, they, they're immobilized and they're waiting for someone to come looking for them. You see what I'm saying? Why wouldn't your brain go to that? Oh, he just took her somewhere. They'll be, it doesn't make sense. If you truly have no concept of what happened, why wouldn't that be an option? Because that's my thing. I get real weird about stuff like that, like car wreck, stuff like that. I mean, like when I like say in work situations have been like the person would be like, okay, who's staffing something like that. When somebody doesn't show up on time, I'm talking like after a few minutes in my mind, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, they're dead in the side of the road. They're dead in the side of the road. Doesn't occur to me. They are just not showing up or they're just running late and they didn't call like something unprofessional, right? It's, oh my God they're they're in the ditch and they're this and they're that i mean it's and it's dramatic on my part but that's just my thing so that's why situations like this i'm like why why wouldn't that be an option so it's almost like you knew they had to be okay in that way but if you knew that then you know what i'm saying it doesn't make sense to me so anyways the fbi goes and talks to gail remember this is b's wife and the, the wife of b and she tells him about this rv that they had in the storage unit so they go there and it's gone. So the hunt's on. So they've had a five day head start. Now remember, this is way back when, okay? They don't have stuff like we do now. They've had all this time to run. All this time. It's insane. So the hunt is on. They find B's car, okay? It has a blown out window, 
blood on it so the state park or whatever but they learn that this is like fake or whatever right so they find the motorhome tire tracks but there's only one set of footprints and they're basically like okay this was him carrying her from the car to the motorhome they're at it like they know they're like um girl this guy completely kidnapped your child and they're basically just like what huh no that's not an option so this is what major manhunt is on and this goes on four weeks not four weeks but four weeks so they talk to B's brother, Joe. And he says that his brother was always a perv, always into little girls, and was a horrible human being. As if we didn't know this by now, right? So the brother, his own blood, is telling them, this guy, bury him up to his neck in a mound of fire ants. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's the scum of the earth, okay? So his brother's saying all this stuff, spilling all this tea on him. Well, at this time, and this is where, okay, I said this earlier, at this time, ped cases were kind of rare. He had done this to other families, but they had put a stop to it, and then B met his family, and they fell for it. So they'll talk to other people, like, that inter, you know, interacted in these situations in the neighborhood and at church, and other people will, I mean, they'll say, and again, I'm probably jumping ahead, I might have this in there, but I'm just gonna say it in case I don't. Yeah, we hung out with that family when one time talking about B's family. We hung out with them one time and we, there was something off. There, mm -mm. and you know, the one guy was basically just like, mm -mm. nope, we will never, my family is not gonna be around that man and their family. I have to protect my family and there's something ain't right with that. But he, this is probably what people like him do. They just go from family to family to family and they find one such as this family that he victimized and he sees all these ways to exploit them and get to the child. We're getting ready to cover some of the ways that he broke the family up. So Jan and her sister talk, the narrative switches here. Jan and her sister talk about when they were growing up and they shared a room at one point. B is like, hey, don't y'all want your own separate rooms or whatever? It was this huge room. And the follow-up, they go back to the house. And you can see the wall that he built and everything. Super creepy. Okay, well, that's for another video. I'm sorry, but I had to throw that in there. Okay, so he's basically like, don't y'all want this? And so he talks to the parents and all this. And he's like, I'll build a wall and make you your own room in there. So he does this. They all join in. They help. This gives him a reason to be at the house. And it also made him to be able to separate Jan. I put what were the parents thinking. Now they follow up with this in the secondary part. It doesn't matter and I'm not going to get that confused with this one right now. A grown man that is not your father and let's leave it at that because at that point even when you talk maybe an uncle you know a cousin a family member whatever can I get it but even then so I'm like eh. You know, if it's not, wh why would you let a stranger in your daughter's room build a wall out like that to separate them? No. <laughs> okay, with, with some of the stuff that was already going on, no, right? Another neighbor says that he has a habit of whining and dining you. And then once he has you comfortable, he takes advantage of you. If you've dealt with like narcissists and sociopaths, again, I'm not qualified to give those diagnoses, but you've dealt with people like this that do that, where they work you in and then it's like, hey, now can you do this for me? That type thing. So th this is what I was talking about earlier right here. The same neighbor says that they spent a day at the lake or something like that with them and the, all the families and they could tell that something was just off and then in there he told his wife that that was the last time they'll ever do anything with them now it goes back to jan and she's talking about doing sleepovers with the neighbors and the kids this is b and they would they had this big trampoline out back and so she was like we would basically make these cots on the trampoline it sounds like i mean just think back to childhood nostalgia the crickets going a summer night you can get yourself there right so they would do this so she says one night she wakes up and basically her undergarments are missing it was like her thing her whatever you call it, nightgown had like ridden all the way up. And basically Bob is sitting there touching her, like right outside her, to, what do you call that? The, the sleeping the sleeping bag. And he basically explains this away to her, to Gail, all this, he gets out of it, you know, but that was the first of like, you know, huh. But again, she trusted this man with all her everything. So, and she's a child. So at this point, a child's not thinking the way an adult, you know what I'm saying? Like she could explain it away. Like, oh, I guess I had a nightmare or I, mean, I don't know. That was weird. And you know, anyways, uh, because she didn't catch him doing something physical, like in the act, you know what I'm saying? It was just a creepy thing to be like, I'm waking up and Bob's like, or B's right next to me outside my sleeping thing in my panties. And you know, what's what, you know, kind of a thing. So the sister describes a time that Jan 
Jam went on vacation with B and his family. And when they came back, B's like, yeah, you know, Jan started not feeling good. She was getting wobbly at dinner and almost passing out. So I, I had to take her back to the hotel room. Of course, this would be by himself. And she remembers one time, one of those, she woke up and she saw him walking around naked. So the FBI says that they never saw this come in the family. Uh, they fell right into a trap and he knew in order to get Jan, he would have to destroy them, the parents, the family first. It goes back to two years before the kidnapping. So a lot of this stuff we've been talking about, it starts off with the event of the kidnapping and then it takes you back and it's like walking you through to what really, you know, li the led up to this kidnapping. So Mary Ann, remember this is the mother, says that he caught her, or he called her from the furniture store. B owned a furniture store in town and he calls her up and he's like, hey, I can't get out to lunch. It's so busy. How about you bring me a sandwich down? Now, before we go on, I find myself sitting here thinking this over the whole sandwich thing. Remember, this is like back when like 70s or whatever, right? Times are different. People's roles and situations are different. You know, she stay at home. She does this. So the first thing when it was like he called her up from his furniture store was like, I can't leave. How about you bring me a sandwich? And then she did it. And I'm before you even get into what actually happens, I'm like, oh, you brought another man a sandwich. God, Mary Ann. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then I'm just like, like it, it was my past life in this time, you know, because I'm in my world, I'm thinking, I mean, am I crazy? But in that context, if we went back there, wouldn't that be kind of naughty? You know what I'm saying? First and foremost, starting with him calling up and putting her in that situation, because I'm just like, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it seems just so off for him to even do that. We know why he was doing it, you know? And she was being nice. She's like, oh, okay, you're stuck. I'll bring you a sandwich. I'm at home. Okay, cool. You know, but it's just, it's such an innocent thing that's just, there's so many things attached to it. When we talk about what happened, then we'll know why. And maybe this is why I think that. So it calls her up, you know, bring a sandwich. So she said that B basically does this. And then he basically is like flattering her. And he's like, you know, baby, you're really beautiful. Baby, them pantyhose look real good on them legs. You know, and like just complimenting her, telling her how sexy she was. All these things that she didn't hear from her husband. And this woke something up in her. And she said that this was the beginning of her affair. This affair went from something innocent, if you will, to a full-blown, like we doing it kind of a thing. But this is the origins of that. So now you see why it seems a little naughty that she brought the sandwich because we see where this light leads. It wasn't about the sandwich then this is where it gets real naughty. She goes to a church function with him and they take a side trip to the mountains and they get frisky. They return home and she tries to forget about it, but she was basically hooked at that point. Now here is my thing with that. And I feel like almost like Bridges of Madison County. I think I said this in a live where he woke something up in her and that was very hard for her to turn away from. She had been with the same dude. And here is one thing that's going on and we're gonna, well, I'm gonna wait to say that about the father. God rest his soul, he's no longer with them. Meaning he's passed on, not that he left them. Uh, and I'm talking about the, the victim, Jan's dad. But something has awakened in her. And again, he probably realized when he saw the dynamics of the two of them, I see exactly what's going on here. I know how to find my way with her. And that's what he did. So Jan's father, this is what we're getting into next. So Jan's father, Bob, says that B was very knowledgeable when it came to the bedroom, but that he didn't have a wife that basically satisfied him. And he said that one day B came and was like, Bob, I just, can I pick you up from work? I need to ride around and just vent for a minute. So he does. And he's like, we rode around, we're laughing and joking, all this. And B's just going on about, I can't stand my wife, man. So stressful. I'm really pent up. You know, I just, I, I need some relief. I'm a man. I've got needs. She's not providing them. I need some relief, Bob. You know, come on, baby. Come on, Bob, baby. Come on, you're looking real pretty today, baby. <laughs> okay, so side note story. When I was first watching this and this was going on, now he's already defiled the whole damn family at this point, right? And now we're talking about the damn father. I was before work and I remember paused the TV and I was like this, I was like, if they so much as say that the dad slept with this man next, I'm picking the TV up and throwing it out the damn window. Y'all, when I press play, this is what comes up next. So they're riding around, talking about they can't stand the wife, all that. They're laughing, they're joking. He kept asking him to give him for some relief. And B says, so finally I reached over and gave him relief with my hand. 
to completion. Okay, and he was very regretful over this, and it really upsets him, the father. Y'all, I felt, I was like, what? What? They also talk about in the follow-up, but we'll save that for the next one. Okay, so here's the thing that I have to say, and I'm just, I'm being as respectful as I can be in this, and if you've watched it, you'll know what I'm talking about, because this is what I think, this is my theory on B, seeing the two of them. When they're interviewing the father, and again, God rest his soul, he's no longer with them. You know, your, or my, I'm just gonna say my gaydar was like, boom, 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 bing, 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 with him for multiple reasons. So then when we find out that he, you know, helps him out, gives him a helping hand, literally. And then we find out from Marianne that she's like, well, B was telling me my hair was pretty and that my legs were sexy and things that Bob had never told me or in many years. I was like, this is exactly what happened. And we'll get to what he does to use this relationship he has with Bob against him. But I'm like, he saw this, probably anybody could, of something going on here with this scenario. Maybe everybody's not quite sure where they're at, different time. It's not that cool to maybe come out of the closet. So they're in this scenario. I'm, and again, I think this is how B thought. I'm guessing that Marianne's a little bit starved for some type of affection that maybe she ain't getting at home. Well, he was right. Then he knew to go to Bob and hone right in on that little, you know, thing that might be present and because a lot of dudes what he described aren't going to be manipulated in that context to do what he did to him allegedly it was this one time but i have a feeling it was more it's probably a little bit of an ongoing thing but i don't know that they didn't say that that's just me thinking that so again no tea no shade on that but it's just i i can see how this was a, a way in for him he saw this as a weakness in the marriage so there's that i mean this is the thing this guy will go to no link like there's no low right he'll even do this so what sounds like a police interview B is describing, here we go, how he entered into a homosexual relationship with Jan's father strictly to get access to her. He had a fixation on Jan, but he does not know why. So the way that he talked about it, like I entered into a homosexual relationship, that's why I think it was more than one time. Because why would you say, I got him to give me a hand, you know what, in the car. You want to describe that as a homosexual relationship. I mean, maybe you would back then, but that just sounds like you've got, you know, a helping hand in the car one time. You know what I'm saying? So to me, that's where I think more of it was going on, but there's a lot of shame around that. And the family's probably not wanting to say that the dad's not wanting to, so he probably was better off making it sound like that. But again, I don't know that. That's not fact. I was not there. They did not say this. It's me just coming up with my own thing and reading between the lines. And again, he's not here to say any other way. So it is what it is. It's just a theory as to how I think possibly things could have gone in the way that this dude viewed this family, the dude B&B. So in 1974, he was essentially, so we're going back to talking about B now. He was essentially reprimanded by the LDS church. He sought counsel with them and they even sent him to a shrink in California, a psychologist in California to help him overcome his obsession with Jan. He comes back and he tells the family, meaning Marianne, Bob, them, that when he was a kid, he had relations with his aunt and that he's basically working to get over his own trauma, his own stuff. And that he says that one of the forms of therapy is for him to spend time alone with their daughters. And they agreed to this specifically with Jam. He offers for them to call the psychologist to have everything explained. They say, no, we trust you. So basically the therapy is, is to lay in the bed with the daughter I mean, just gather yourself, okay? So, <laughs> it gets worse. So, he would go in the room and lay down next to Jam. And the mother says we were uncomfortable with him doing this, but if it was part of his therapy, we were, you know, we'd let him do it. He would listen to these weird, creepy tapes while he lay next to her. It would later turn out that his therapist who told him to do this was not licensed and had actually had their license revoked. Imagine that. Now, spoiler alert for the second one, the follow-up, they, Jan will say in this one that he was always on the outside of the covers and that her mom was coming in and out of the room to like fold clothes and do this and that. I don't care. Okay. The the way they talk like well it was for B's therapy so we said okay we want you to get better that's the part that I have such a hard time wrapping my mind around because I'm like why you 
Wh I mean, I don't even know how to say the sentence. Why would you allow a grown man to lay in your daughter's bed? I, it, that astounds me. So, and I'm sure obviously they regret it now. You know what I'm saying? Looking back, but that part blows my mind. I'm not gonna lie. Okay, so it go, and of course the, the psychologist had their license revoked, right? Like who, plays like this was a real therapy right it probably was another pad you know what i'm saying who was just like yeah i'll give you a little prescription you know you can thank me later you know what i mean go lay in the bed with little girls strange not even your own daughter you know what i'm saying like to read a bedtime story but like, literally a, a neighbor's daughter and listen to a creepy tape talking about her stroking you are you kidding me and this passed the vibe chat it just i i, I know i keep going back to it but it infuriates me <laughs> this is why it's almost like by i have to watch this documentary like once every five years Years because it literally I get this worked up over it. I mean, and I shouldn't. They seem to have moved on and healed. I haven't healed from it. <laughs> okay, I have not healed from this documentary. Okay, so okay, so it goes back to the father, and he says they never had an inkling that he had he B and B had these desires for their daughter. In fact, they didn't really even know what a. a person like him was back then. He says, I don't know how we were so gullible. There were so many red flags. And I believe him when he says that, but it's still shocking that they didn't see this. You know what I mean? It's still like, okay. Especially since you hear from other families who spent one day around them or were like, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like this, no. Yeah, but I don't want to sit here and victim blame them either because this is what I'm talking about where this is so weird where it's like you have these different layers of victimization, you know, because it's like the parents were supposed to protect Jan who just kind of threw her out there multiple times, right? And then the parents who are like sitting here bamboozled, like, we didn't know. Like, uh, you know, then he did this to me and... It, it just, it's this such this unique case that's just like unheard of. Anyways, okay, let's keep going. So, court transcripts would show that B slept in Jan's bedroom four times a week for six months. Four times a week for six months. One more time. Four times a week. There's seven days in a week, more than half the week for six months, half a year. And guess what? He does this right up until the day that he abducts her. Then the narrative switches back to the time that he took her and Jan is talking. Jan says she wakes up. She can tell that she's moving and clearly she's in an RV, but she's strapped down to this bed. And then there's this white box next to the bed. And basically this mechanical voice will start playing. And she says, it's saying these things about an alien and you know, this and that and just crazy stuff. And she says she immediately thought she had been abducted by a UFO. So the voice in the box tells her that she is part alien and that her mission is to have a baby. And by doing this, this will save this alien planet by the time, when she has to have the baby by the time she's age 16, it will save this alien planet. The voice tells her that she will meet her male companion. The voice tells her if she does not do this, horrible things will happen to her family, to her, everything. So she's gonna meet her male companion. So when she walks out of the bedroom at one point, when she comes to and it doesn't, isn't strapped down, she sees B. Shocker, right? He's on the couch, he's bloody. He, she it's like thinks he's dead. So she's essentially like, oh my God, I'm not, it's B, I know him, I love him. What's wrong, is he alive? You know, and she's like, B, wake up, you have to wake up. Oh my God, what do we do? Okay, so then, she assumes that he's the male companion she's supposed to have a child with. And he will describe a scene that he's like, yeah, when I picked you up and we were going and it's like these bright lights and basically we were abducted by a UFO. She 100% believes the story. Without a doubt, she believes that she is part alien and is meant to have a child with this man to save the alien planet or basically everyone's gonna die. So... Again, she's a kid. She's a kid. Clearly, there's probably some stuff going on at home that, I mean, we see with the parents, you know what I'm saying? Like, she might be rather gullible. Like, very, there's a better word for it. Very sheltered. Very naive. You know, and two, when you're young, I mean, you believe in stuff that isn't real a lot of times. You know what I'm saying? So, this might not have been a far stretch. So, that being said, 
let's keep going. So the narrative switches back to B's brother. And he says that he got a call from B saying that he needs to get permission from Marianne, this is Jan's mother, for him to marry Jan. So this is their missing all the yards. He needs to get permission from the, from the mother for him to marry Jan in the United States. He says that he took her to Mexico and they got married because it's legal, 40 something year old to a 12 year old at this time. But it's not legal here in the United States, obviously. And he says that he'll come back if they'll do that. But if they disagree, they will never see their child again. So the brother is essentially like, uh, well, of course, the parents, first of all, they amazingly say no. Okay. They're like, we can't agree to this. The brother's like, you know what? Screw this. My brother is a total creep. I'm going to help bring him down. So he basically works with FBI to like help track them down and whatnot. And it goes more into that the second one about how they do that, but we'll talk about that in that video. Now, once they're incarcerated, she says that B traded his one of its like his wedding band or something with one of the guards for them to bring her to him. And when I say they're incarcerated, B is incarcerated, but she was like in this little room. So he gives the ring, has them bring her down. And basically he says that he was visited by the alien people. They told him to tell her she can't talk about the pills that he gives her. He's he says that she can't talk about any of the stuff that would lead back to like what was really going on. He says that if she talks to other men or anybody at all about what's going on, her sister's gonna go blind and they're gonna go take his take out her father and like all this bad stuff will happen. So the parents fly up to pick Jan up and after a very brief hug, she's basically like, What's going on? What happened to B? Why are you here? You know, why'd you call the FBI? And she is pissed. So B is brought back to America and charged with kidnapping, and they have her taken to a physician who says that her hymen or I believe it is was not broken so he's like there was no SA involved in this so they don't think that she's been essayed so you know at home Jan is very standoffish remember she's been completely victimized on multiple levels at this point she doesn't really talk to anybody she says she wasn't kidnapped and Jan says that she was mostly concerned with completing the mission in her world she was like we got work to do we've got to finish the alien thing so that's like a little fire under her butt over this right the FBI instructs Marianne and Bob to stay away from B and his wife and their kids, but they don't do this. Now this part really cooks my grits right here. So Christmas Eve, Gail, remember that's B's wife. She comes over, she knocks on the door. She's like, hey, she's like, I need to talk to Bob completely alone. Marianne's like, yeah, it's okay. Do you want some water? And so she goes in there and talks to him. This is what she wants. She basically asks him, do not press charges against B, please drop the charges. And she says, if you don't drop the charges. We will go public with your relationship with B and let everyone know about your soft spot for him. So what do the parents do, meaning Marianne and Bob? They sign affidavits saying that, nope, we don't think that he kidnapped her. We don't think this happened. None of that happened. Mm -mm, we're not going to press charges, none of this stuff. Now the trial will still move forward, but like nothing happens. Now remember during this time, Jan's like at home going to school, all this type of stuff. So she says that B would still come to see her. The box was at her house. That's what blows my mind. I'm like, how is the box still there? The box is still next to her bed at home, telling her this alien stuff. And she says that he would show up. He would continue telling her about the mission, doing things to her. She would get notes at school to go meet her at a particular phone, all this kind of stuff. And she got love letters from him. She felt like she needed to write them back to him. So it was this back and forth thing. And Jan says that the shift from loving him like a father to loving him like a man happened. And the mother says that Jan came to her and says that Jan was like, I want to marry him and have children with him. Like, this is my man. And what's heartbreaking about this, because you see this in a lot of these abuse cases, and I don't know the obvious, I don't obviously know the psychological term for it, but where this happens, where you fall in love with your captor or whatever, you know, abuser and this type of thing but this is an extreme case because remember the things that are being done are intimate and this is going to be so confusing and damaging for a child even more so when you start to then be like this is okay what is this but i have feelings you know what i'm saying so this sadly happens to jam now it says here uh, the narrative switches back to the mother Maryam, and she says that oh, this part's gonna really just absolutely just cook your beans okay she says that robert was calling her every day telling her how much he loved her how much he wanted her in his life and she's like tell me why you married jan why did you marry jan and he says if you'll come see me i'll tell you so keep this in mind so the things happen first right the first kidnapping the marriage all this stuff right so he's calling her up now he's like staying in the camper somewhere life is very disruptive for him and his wife and kids and all this type of stuff so he's calling 
what's her name? Uh, Marianne Ob talking about, hey, baby, I want to see them sexy legs again, baby. And he's like, she's like, why'd you do this? And he's like, come down here and I'll tell you. She goes, spoiler alert, she goes. She went to his motorhome. He kept telling her how much he loved her. And they end up making love. That part right there took me out. I was like, gross. I'm sorry. I mean, and I, I know I'm being judgmental, but that, that right there, I'm like, are you kidding me? The man who took your daughter and you're at his motor home banging him because he said your hair looked cute that day. I mean, and I know I'm being dramatic about the hair looked cute that day, but you get what I'm saying, right? Again, they seem to have moved past this in the family. It's not my thing. It's there. So more power to him, right? So there's that. She knew she had messed up. But guess what happens? Five days later, B calls Bob up, Marianne's husband, and is like, guess what? I had Marianne. Sorry. Yeah, wasn't that good either. He didn't say that. But you can see, I'm sure he would slide that in there or something like that, right? He tells her what happened. Well, you already know. Bob's probably sitting over there like, well, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> Remember, they both are sleeping with the dude, right? Apparently, Bob only, you know, little help and hand things in the car. Who knows how many times. She's gone on and had a full-blown affair. So, the narrative switches to her husband and to Bob, not B, but Bob. And he says, that's when the real problems began in our marriage. And I was literally, when he said that, I was like, that's when? Yikes. You know, but again, whatever. Let's just move on. So, <laughs> that's when the things begin in the marriage. The affair between Mary and B lasts for eight months. Guess how many times during that, that B visited Jan? Nine times. So, the husband... Bob files for divorce because he essentially is like, this dude's trying to move my wife into his house and get Jan. You know, something like, this is very bad. I have to protect the children. So he files for divorce and gets a thing for her to vacate the home, Marianne to vacate the home. So she basically, or no, I'm sorry. So that happens. Then B calls Bob and he says that he's going to, tells Bob, you're going to lose your wife and kids. And, you know, he then goes to Marianne and says, you need to move in with me. And she's like, uh, no. And he's like, look, all you have to do is get a divorce and say that Bob, your husband, is gay. And I had to fair. And you'll get the kids. And it's all over with. Well, you already know why he wants to get the kids. She's like, this is getting crazy. So she goes to an attorney. And the attorney is like, you need to cut the cancer out of your marriage. It ain't Bob. It's B. So she goes home. They reconcile. She moves back in. Now, as far as the trouble that B got into, he pleads guilty to some kind of like lesser kidnapping charge. He only ends up having to serve 45 days. But of that, he only did 10 days for good time. For all that, 10 days, okay? Because the parents wouldn't testify and all that. And the FBI agent's like, yes, the parents chose themselves over her daughter's, their daughter's safety. Because had they gone with it and, and bit the bullet and said, okay, you can expose my husband, the second thing we're about to talk about wouldn't have happened because they could have lied, the, thrown away the key, basically. So after all that, guess what B decides to put his money into? He buys a family fun center. Of course he did. What? else would he buy? Maybe a Chuck E. Cheese, if they had that back then. Jan insists on going and working there one summer. I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And they're like, she made this house so miserable and so turned up, we, uh, we just had to let her go. She stays for two weeks. Jan says the mission continues and they continue, you know, doing the things you do to have the alien baby. And Jan says that he told her, because remember at this point she's in love with him, she thinks. She says that he told her that him and Gil were going to get a divorce. And she's super excited. She's ready to get married. And she's like, I was in love with him. So you see where the dynamic probably changed between them, where it was no longer like a predator type thing. You know what I'm saying? So Jan continues to stick to the story that she believes she had to do this to save the alien planet. Jan goes home and it's really bad. So she goes to her house house. Jan eventually then disappears after a couple of weeks. They wait another two weeks before calling the same FBI agent. Agent. Oh my God. I mean, you just, you know what I'm saying? And they're like, you're kidding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, tell us it's a prank, you know, kind of a thing. They're just like, this, uh, I mean, what would you say if you're that FBI guy? So they put recordings on the phone, all this type of stuff, because this is what's going on. She's gone. B's calling their house up talking about this. Have you heard from Jan? I've not heard from her. 
I hope she's safe. And then he'll be like this other times. I talked to her. I told her to call you. I'm really worried about her. She said she's having to do awful things for money on those streets. I mean, just your classic stuff. So, but he's calling the parents, telling her this stuff. So, he's pretending that she's missing, doesn't know where she's at. This goes on for months. But the FBI finally finds him and they inside his motorhome he has this like shrine built to her with poster sized pictures of her it's so creepy so then one day and, and they find him but like nothing's really like come of this yet right so one day jan calls home and it's like super emotional the family freaks out and they you know but she says that she still wants to marry b so finally one day when they are trailing b they figure out that he has Jan hidden away in a Catholic school. So he basically came up with this whole story with nuns that he was CIA and this and the other. Puts her in there under a laugh, fake last name. He is rearrested on probation violation charges. Jan has to go back home and she's super pissed. She literally apparently walked in the front door, didn't say one damn word and went right to her room. So... The family was like, she was gone. She was a shell of a human being at this point. Okay, so remember how I said that the dad, Bob of Jan, had a business, a floral business? Well, one night it burns to the ground and they go there and he's like, I feel like B is behind it. Well, it turned out B convinced a couple of dudes that he was in jail with that he's like, I'll pay you off and hook you up if you go burn this building down. So he gets hit with more charges for this. Now here's the thing, B is able to beat most of these charges that he gets in and all this stuff. He is court ordered to a mental facility and let out six months later. I mean, the way he can scheme the system every time, he gets away with it. So about a year and a half later, Jan says she questioned the existence of the aliens and that B wasn't talking to her that much as she was getting older. She was only getting ready to turn 16. But we hear about this in these situations where these dudes like B will destroy everything in their path to get to this person. But then when they grow out of this zone, bye. Who's next? It's just, it's it's a done with thing. So she's sitting here. Remember, she has all these crazy feelings and all this stuff. So she's almost 16. Well, remember also for the alien story, they're like, look, if you don't have this baby by the time you're 16, like bad stuff's going to happen to you and your family. So she describes a moment of her mom calling her while she's at camp. And the mom's basically saying like the dog, dogs aren't feeling well. Well, while she was at camp, she had talked to a boy. Remember B said you can't talk to boys or bad stuff will happen? The alien said. So she's like, oh my God, I talked to that boy. And now the dogs are sick it's true so she's like super weird and all that well she said like the next day basically her mom called and was like the dogs are fine today like don't go have fun there or whatever and that was like one of the first things that she was like well wait a minute i thought that you know the earth was supposed to blow up over this but it didn't so then when she turned 16 she didn't disintegrate nothing bad happened she was like huh i guess the alien thing wasn't true and this is like groundbreaking to her so fast forward now you know so she's like okay this isn't real whatever so then fast forward 28 years later and it shows jan as she's speaking uh, about a, a book stolen innocent turner mother wrote a book on this and she's speaking about being kidnapped and brainwashed and that type of stuff so she's doing the circuit well be still alive at this point he's pissed and he's going around talking about there was no absolutely not she's making a b and c up false allegations this that, and the other yada 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 well at one of these things he goes to in the club let me look at my notes here he's threatening her with legal actions all this type of stuff she gets a stalking injunction against him for life well so at one of the events the bikers club ba baka bikers against child abuse they show up and he causes drama like he gets several felony charges from this he is found guilty Guess what they did? They said, go home and come back in a week for sentencing. Y'all, who does, when they do that kind of stuff, I'm just like, and even today's age, I'm like, I wish I, I wish I knew about these crimes out here that you can sit here, go do, go back home before sentencing. Yet these other crimes that it's just like somebody janked off the street for something stupid and locked away forever. You know what I'm saying? This is one of those, I'm like, you let him go home. Guess what happened? 
Guess. You can only guess. They never comes back for sentencing. He goes home and he takes his own life. Now, it will come out that he had done this to numerous girls and numerous families. Jan was just another one on the list. And she will say, you know, all that, that they were, he was a master manipulator. He came in and did this. So these are all the notes that I wrote about it. Now, there's more in depth details to each of those parts for the secondary thing that we're going to watch. I don't know when you're going to see this. It could even be next week, this particular video. So we could have already done the live chat on it. But the thing that's frustrating with this case is when you see the train wreck forming and then starting and forming and starting and constantly crashing and the parents just kind of turning this blind eye or this like well I didn't see anything wrong with this it was like but they also say there's these red flags so it's like they're going against this natural instinct now again everything I've seen is Jan and the family have forgiven each other if there was that if they did that but there's a i mean they're together they're united so that's what counts right not me in my little room with my camera talking about how can they do this you know whatever she's worked through it and that's all that's important it's also shocking to see how many times he was able to skirt through the system this is very scary because this guy just seemed like a very special breed of monster what he was willing to do there was no you know he was going to do anything sleep with the dad sleep with the mom do this do that i mean just the, the alien thing i mean crazy stuff right he's right where he belongs as far as i'm concerned so like i said i am watching the secondary of the follow-up one so we're going to do that this coming week in the live chat and then i'll put a video out about it too so that's it let me know what you think down in the comment section roscoe says thank you for watching i say thank you for watching and roscoe says throw some old sofas down in that comment section until he and i throw ourselves down in the comment section we'll see y'all soon